It all started with a WAN ad. Now, some of you, probably many of you, are too young to remember, but back in the day, the classified ads in the local paper, or the WAN ads, were how you got stuff. Jobs, dates, apartments, cars, a collection of old people, uh, evidently probably slightly used. All of that used to come from the WAN ads, pre-Indeed, pre-Tender, and pre-Craigslist. It's funny, but for years when people have asked me how I got to be where I am in the investment industry, I've always blithely answered, I just found an answer to WAN ad in the local paper for an entry-level hedge fund analyst, and I don't know, I guess the rest is history. I've said that sentence probably hundreds of times as if that advertisement placed really weirdly near a personal ad for a single white male, fat, ugly, and bald seeks women with long toenails was the fulcrum on which my entire professional existence was to balance. As if answering that ad and getting that job and building a 20-year investment career, writing a book, agitating for diversity on Wall Street, as if all of that required no input from me or others before or since, as if it was just dumb luck. Now, my conclusion isn't out of character with my gender. You see, studies since the 1970s show that women have a tendency to attribute their success to luck, while men have a tendency to attribute their success to skill or ability. But surely it can't be that easy, that black and white. You're not either just lucky or good, right? So I decided a little introspection was in order before I got up here to talk to you today because otherwise this discussion about my professional journey would be the shortest and most boring TED talk in history, even if I could mention that weird guy and his toenail fetish. But after many hours of contemplation, I did decide, and maybe shockingly, that every success that I've had, whether professionally or otherwise in life, has been based entirely on luck but not luck in the traditional sense. It wasn't a single happy accident that led me to where I am today, and it certainly wasn't that stupid one ad, but it was rather what I like to think of as a trifecta of luck. There was completely random good luck or serendipity, if you will. There was good luck that was created by other people and given to me as opportunities, large and small, and there was, of course, good luck that I created for myself through what some, evidently based on those studies, mostly dudes, would call hard work and mad skills. Now, the first category of luck was the easiest for me to identify. You see, I grew up poor. And when I say poor, I mean really poor. I like to call it powdered milk poor because until I was old enough to go to elementary school and see liquid milk delivered in cartons, I thought that milk shot out of cow's udders like talcum powder from my granny's Johnson's baby powder bottle and was delivered in a box and had to be mixed with water. My mom worked three jobs, two teaching and one at the Red Diamond Coffee Factory on the weekends, and we were still poor, that kind of poor. But despite my meager beginnings, I was born healthy in a free society to parents who could afford both my powdered milk and, more importantly, the clean water with which to mix it. I was born at a time when women had both the right and the opportunity to obtain an education. I was born at a time when, after my dad left us, my mom was able to get those three poorly paying jobs so that she could support my sister and me. And of course, I was born at a time when it was infinitely possible for a child to do better economically than their parents. And make no mistake, all of that is completely and 100% dumb luck. But for most of us whose last name isn't Trump or Kardashian, the simple happy accident of our birth isn't enough to ensure our continued success, and it certainly wasn't for me. Rather, from the time I was born until now, and hopefully for decades yet to come, I've had people in my life who have been creating luck for me, who have been giving me luck. Based on the stories my mom likes to tell the guys I bring home so that she can humiliate me and really scare the hell out of them, she started creating luck for me when I was about five or six years old and first started testing my voice in the world. At that time, evidently, my entire family went out for a rare evening out at a restaurant and the waiter came around to take everyone's order. When he got to me, he asked, what would you like to drink, little girl? And I looked at him and I said, I want a Shirley Temple and make it a double. <laughs> now, no one knew what to double, 
in a Shirley Temple. I've tended bars since then, and I can honestly say there is no such thing as a double Shirley Temple. But miraculously, a drink did appear, and even more miraculously, my southern mama did not take me outside and tan my hide for using my voice, speaking up, speaking out, and speaking back to an adult who also happened to be a male. Or I could look to my junior high school teacher who for some inexplicable reason decided to teach a bunch of 13-year-old semi-rural Alabama kids how to research and trade stocks. Certainly wasn't something you typically saw on the Alabama public school curriculum back in the 1980s. But nonetheless, I loved that class. For a semester, I was rich. Of course, it was only on paper, but still. Or I could look to my grandparents who, after my great uncle died, decided to gift me a small portion of his inheritance and even allowed me to manage that money myself. I had a tiny account at a local brokerage house in town. Now that ended up being deeply stupid on their part, to be quite honest, because I learned really early in life that shopping is my cardio. And I dropped enormous chunks of change on 80s fabulous items like the ones you see here. Was I good with money back then? Absolutely not. But did that experience teach me about the basics of money and investing and finance and interest and debt and most importantly, financial priorities when I ended up having to take out pretty massive student loans to pay for college because weirdly, my school wouldn't take my fantastic Cindy Lauper wardrobe on trade. Yeah, it, it did do that. Or I could again look to my mom who encouraged me, some might say threatened me, into sticking with STEM at a time when girls have a tendency to drop those topics in droves. Now Microsoft did a study in 2017 that showed that girls have a tendency to lose interest in math at age 11 and they rapidly lose interest in math around age 15. I made it two whole years past that and at age 17 I started skipping trig class every day to go to the Krispy Kreme with friends because donuts and friends were much cooler than trigonometry. So I, the daughter of a teacher, and I didn't mention this earlier, but quite literally a math teacher failed one six week period of math on purpose. When my mom found out, she insisted that I make up the work. She worked with me to pull my grade back up to passing for the semester, and she threatened me with a convent if I didn't comply, and so, comply I did. But at the end of the day, it was these people and these experiences and others like them that allowed me to luck into that infamous want ad job. Comfort with money and the basics of finance? Check. Understanding of the fundamentals of the stock market? Check, check. My future boss was even impressed that I had learned so much from my disastrous inheritance experience that I had saved enough at 27 to invest in my first home solo. And how did I even get that job interview in the first place? It was my infamous Shirley Temple big mouth. I still remember my cover letter said that I could learn anything and everything I needed to for the job and that I could walk barefoot over hot coals carrying a tray full of martinis without spilling a drop. In short, I took the luck that I received serendipitously, I combined it with the luck and opportunity that other people gave me, and then I worked like hell to create a little luck for myself. And in 18 months, I went from stock market neophyte to writing congressional testimony. And from being a fly on the wall in meetings to conversing with reporters from Forbes and the Wall Street Journal. And over the next 20 years, I was able to do a lot of really cool but admittedly geeky things that got me invited to talk to you guys here today. But I don't want you to think that it was all rainbows and puppies and kittens and I'm so lucky moments because it wasn't, and no one's life is. In fact, for every type of good luck that I've identified for you, there is a corresponding type of bad luck. There's completely random bad luck. There's bad luck that, frankly, other people create and give to you, always a fantastic gift to give your friends. And there is, of course, bad luck that you create for yourself. I've been the recipient of all three types of bad luck, most notably all three at the same time in 2014 when I was working on my book. At that time, I started struggling with pretty significant anxiety issues and full-on panic attacks, and that was completely random bad luck. 
I also started having some intellectual property issues at work, which turned into HR issues, which turned into me deciding that I needed to leave the safety and security of my full-time job. And that was primarily bad luck that was created by other people. And finally, as I was trying to build my new business enterprise, I was sending out all these proposals, but I really wasn't doing the best job of following up on them. It just seemed really pushy to try to get people to pay me for my services, and that was nothing but bad luck I created for myself. Needless to say, it was not the most fun 18 months of my life. I pretty quickly figured out, by the way, that you really can't control the random bad luck that may fall into your life any more than you can control whether you're the recipient of serendipity or not. And I do want to say, I did try. I looked at everything from horoscopes to meditation. There may have even been some books on the dark arts in my shopping cart on Amazon at one point before common sense prevailed, and that's the only reason I'm betting there's not an active hellmouth in my backyard at home to this day. But I did figure out there were a few things that I could control, and I decided to focus on those. Number one, I decided that anyone who didn't have at least a semi-vested interest in my continued good fortune, well, they had to go. And so I either let them walk away from me, or I put on my shoes and hit the road myself. Number two, I decided that I could start working to create some good luck and opportunity for myself. Now, I couldn't control when those opportunities might manifest, but I could at least lay the groundwork. And number three, I decided that I could step outside of myself and work to create a little good luck and opportunity for other people who weren't swimming around in the bell jar with me at that particular time. So for myself, I learned to blog, I learned to tweet, I finished my book, I publicized my book, I continued to send out business proposals, I got better at negotiating them, and over time, that portion of my life started to move forward once again. But more importantly, during that time, I decided that I was gonna do one thing to create a little good luck and opportunity for someone else every day, regardless of what was going on in my life, good or bad. I kept a list of those things in a notebook so I could look at it and I could be reminded that my life wasn't the most important thing and that other people had stuff going on too. So I helped a former research assistant find a new and better job. I bought coffee for strangers at Starbucks. I had conversations with new money managers in my industry about how to start and grow their business. With a friend, I rescued and found homes for 56 cats living in a one-bedroom trailer in the middle of nowhere. And let me tell you, friends, that is a stink you never get rid of. <laughs> but luckily, I did get rid of that particular period of bad luck, but the need to create good luck for other people, that stuck with me. And I decided that it was time for me to stop just researching diversity in the investment world and actually actively start to create a more diverse investment community. So I joined the board of a nonprofit, Rock the Street Wall Street, that provides financial and investment literacy education to high school girls. I've recently begun mentoring entrepreneurs with a focus on diverse founders. I traveled the country trying to convince my investment industry peers that investing in diversity will yield enormous financial returns for them, their clients, and really the economy at large. I'm doing all of this because I've seen firsthand how a little bit of luck and opportunity can change someone's life, and that person can go on and try to change something and influence something bigger than them. I'm doing all of this because I've seen firsthand how STEM and the right career choice can lift someone from powdered milk poor to pretty comfortable in just one generation. And I'm doing all of this because I honestly believe that if I can convince enough people to give a little luck and opportunity to people who might not otherwise get it, that one day my industry won't be so overwhelmingly pale, male, and stale. Now, to be quite honest, my industry still has a really long way to go. You should know I have never once had to wait in line for the women's room at an investment industry conference ever, and that is because Women are grossly underrepresented at every level of my industry. Women are only 35.5% of registered investment advisors, 23%
of certified financial planners, 18% of chartered financial analysts, 11.7% of senior private equity professionals, 9% of mutual fund managers, 8% of investment professionals within venture capital, 2.5% of hedge fund managers, and female founders received only 2.19% of venture capital in 2017. Now, part of this springs from the fact that despite how far we've come as a society, boys and girls still have radically different experiences when it comes to investing and STEM and money and finance. For example, boys are more likely to be paid an allowance than girls. If they're paid for chores, chances are boys are paid more for the same chores than girls. Even in babysitting, which is no joke, 97% female, boy babysitters earn more. Women report that they are less likely to have conversations uh, in their household about financial matters, including pretty personal things like, how are we going to pay for your college? And of course, as I've already mentioned, girls are more likely to drop out of STEM during puberty. So the work that I do with girls really focuses on two things. Number one, we want to provide investment and financial literacy education at a critical stage of STEM development before girls start dropping out. If you wait until college or later, quite simply, it's probably too late. And number two, we want to provide girls with a female financial mentor so they can get a sense of what my industry is really like. Because let's face it, if you watch movies about Wall Street, you probably think my whole industry is hookers blow and screwing people over to make a buck. But in fact, a lot of what we do is help colleges and universities like these build their endowment so that they can provide scholarships to deserving students or help teachers like my mom retire securely so that they can live independently and not move in with me and further jack up my already really messed up dating life. But even if girls don't choose to go into a career in investing, there's still tons of reasons to invest in their financial future. Over 90% of women report that they are the sole or shared financial decision maker in their household at some point in their life. Women run 36% of small businesses. Women run companies created 9 million jobs in 2017. Women control over 50% of the investable wealth in this country, and that number is growing to 66% by 2030. And women typically invest a higher percentage of their salary in their homes, families, and communities. In short, women are so money. So we really ought to be good with it, right? And there's proof, by the way, that early intervention actually does pay huge dividends. The girls in our Rock the Street Wall Street program show an average 97% increase in financial literacy from the start of the program to the end of the program. And 67% report that they're now very likely or extremely likely to consider a major or minor in a STEM topic like economics, accounting, or finance. But you don't have to be part of a formal initiative in order to make a difference in the life of a daughter, a niece, a cousin, a friend, a complete and utter stranger. Remember all that stuff I said about allowances and chores and babysitting and just having conversations about money? Any one of you can do any one of those things to create a little luck for someone else. In fact, one woman I know managed to spark an interest in the business world in her daughter and her daughter's friend merely by talking positively about what she does at work when she's at home. And sure enough, one day, her daughter and her daughter's friend were on a play date, and they came into the kitchen, and they were rolling suitcases behind them. As a concerned parent, she said, hey, are you girls running away? No, the girl said, we're going to a board meeting. <laughs> at the end of the day, I want to be joined by so many women in the investment industry that I will literally pee my pants waiting in line for the bathroom at an investment conference. But I need your help. And hopefully today you've learned that you can be a catalyst not just for yourself, but for other people. And so all I ask today is that when you leave here, you go out into the world and you consider ordering up a little luck. And like my infamous Shirley Temple, I hope you'll consider making it a double. Thank you very much.